Thank you for joining us for week five of MDA's ALS virtual learning series. My name is Marissa Lozano, and I'm the Director of Community Education here at the Muscular Dystrophy Association. We are thrilled to have you join us today for this webinar. This learning series is part of our larger MDA community education programs, which focus on bringing the neuromuscular disease community together around education and resources. Uh, we encourage you to visit uh, the community education uh, page on mda.org for updates on upcoming events. We are also recording today's uh, webinar and it will be posted to our website um, for on-demand viewing at a later date. Please know that all phone lines have been muted, but we will have a question and answer session at the end of the webinar. Uh, you can use the chat feature to type in your questions and feel free to send them in as you think of them and they'll be addressed after the presentation. I'd also like to thank our webinar supporters, Mitsubishi Tanabe Pharma America and Cytokinetics. We would not be able to provide community education webinars like this if not for their generous support. So we're very thankful for uh, their support. For over 70 years, MDA has led the way in accelerating research, advancing care, and advocating for the support of our families. Our mission is to empower people living with muscular dystrophy, ALS, and related neuromuscular diseases to live longer, more independent lives. Our mission comes to life through four pillars, care, champion, catalyst, and community. If you haven't done so already, we invite you to join the MDA community by registering with us. So I would now like to introduce one of our guests and our, our speaker today, Mary Holt Pallone. Mary is the program coordinator and mental health specialist for the Neurodegenerative Disease Center and the MDA ALS Center of Hope at Temple University in Philadelphia. Mary has worked within the fields of neuromuscular and neurodegenerative diseases since 2005 and is passionate about caring for patients and families, facilitating support groups, connecting resources, educating communities and fellow healthcare providers, and advocating for improved quality of life among the neurodegenerative population. Thank you for being here today, Mary, and I'll now turn the time over to you. Great, thank you so much, Marissa, and really so glad that you are um, here to see the webinar and I'm certainly honored to be here and also thrilled that uh, I don't have to introduce myself. So I really appreciate that, Marissa. Um, yes, it's a deep honor for me to be, um, to have been and to continue to be involved in the ALS and the neuromuscular community for so long. Uh, it really is a deep passion and I have sincerely learned so much from um, the families and the people that I work with. So my heart sincerely goes out to all of you, of course, um, and Marissa and everyone at MDA, thank you as well for all that you guys do for so many years supporting us and the families. We really, really appreciate it. Um, all right, so I am actually going to attempt to share my screen here for us. We'll just have a few slides uh, as we talk about, you know, kind of laying the groundwork for and the foundation for our conversation um around caregiving in ALS uh this evening um so certainly uh here's my first slide just so you know yes I am in Philadelphia Pennsylvania I work with uh Temple the Temple Health System now our multidisciplinary center here is called the MDA ALS Center of Hope um, I also, I'm the program coordinator of the Neurodegenerative Disease Center, so we also have two other pillars of movement disorders and uh, dementia. Um, in the ALS world, I've worked for about 19 years, so it's really been um, a true blessing in my life. All right, we'll see if we can. There. Okay, so our objectives this evening are just to, we're going to just discuss caregiving briefly, um, just to give an overview and a sense of really what is that when we mention the word caregiving, uh, caregiver. We'll talk briefly about the challenges and the potential, potential challenges, potential benefits of caregiving, as well as moving into a discussion just briefly again about mental health in general and overview. And then one piece that I feel is really important for all people, myself included, um, especially for our caregivers, are is to be able to notice, you know, the differences and the nuances between 
you know, what's kind of having a tough day as opposed to really noticing decline over time. So we'll talk a bit about that. And certainly, certainly we will talk about caring for the mental health and also uh, resources, um, a, a few slides on various resources for uh, our caregivers. Okay, so Rosalind Carter, I really love this um, quote where she says, there are only four types of people in the world. Those who have been caregivers, those who are currently caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need a caregiver. So for many years, I have to say that I was involved with working with these uh, various families. You know, the, the care partner, care person, caregiver, whatever we choose to call them, that wasn't so much discussed. Um, and the focus was really on the person living with the illness. And I, have been thrilled to see and part of that movement um, that really creating more conversation and support and the involvement that um, caregivers themselves are really so important to this whole piece and really deserve um, support and care themselves. So this quote to me really says that, you know, all of us as humans will be one of these at some point. So it is such a need that we that we identify this and i'm so grateful that we're having this conversation tonight so let's talk about really what is a caregiver and i have certainly met uh, a number of people that you know sometimes that word can be somewhat foreign to a person that's helping someone else out um and also we can also I, i've experienced people where it kind of rub, rubs them the wrong way um, so a caregiver, what we consider that, you know, we use this label as caregiver or care partner uh, sometimes, and that helps us just to identify um, this person that's helping. And it really could be anyone. It can be anyone, anyone that helps with anything from just making phone calls or, um, you know, scheduling an appointment or whatever it may be, all the way up to assisting with and performing all sorts of activities of daily living for another person. So just to help people identify and understand that um, if we are giving help to another on a consistent basis or a somewhat consistent basis, we can, we do qualify as a caregiver. You know, we, we also, that this, role that we have now taken on, um, then, you know, really deserves consideration and attention and support. Uh, caregivers certainly can be paid or unpaid. Um, it can be anyone, like I mentioned, from family, friend, colleague, um, a home health aide, HHA is a home health aide. Um, yeah, spouse, sibling, child, parent, all sorts of various people. Um, and, and, and what I mentioned down here lastly, very, very important. So certainly when people come to our center, um, we realize that, you know, ALS, of course, as you all know, affects everyone involved. Um, so the support and the conversations and the considerations and, you know, some of the decision making and things like that really have to involve everyone. So we really try to address all of the needs of the whole system. So just talking about caregiving and ALS, um, I actually have, I've used this uh, slide a few times when I've given talks on caregiving. Um, there are a number of support groups that I facilitate and one has been an ongoing caregiver uh, ALS caregiver support group. And, you know, I asked them um, over various, you know, over the years and things, and um, these words continually come up when somebody, when I ask them to describe, you know, caregiving, complex, uh, continually changing. Someone says to me that uh, they're forever prepared for everything that happened last month. Today, I'm forever prepared for everything that happened last month. So, and ALS, it certainly is a continually changing target. Um, it's difficult. It's honorable. Multitude of duties. It's rewarding. Unexpected. Unwanted. So, these are some of the words that caregivers themselves give to me and share with us as the team um, and fit very appropriately. 
So let's just briefly, you know, and, and just so I put a disclaimer out there that, of course, these lists are not exhaustive or all inclusive. We could go on and on and on, certainly. Um, and this just shows, you know, a bit of the emotional challenges involved in caregiving. And we can kind of see this stormy picture here. You know, confusion, a lot of confusion um, can arise from time to time, all the time. Disrupted sleep patterns, there can be tremendous amount of fatigue, fear, worry, anxiety. Um, guilt, I often, you know, guilt for leaving the house, guilt for feeling frustrated, all sorts of reasons that people experience guilt around caregiving. Increased stress, certainly, loneliness. Um, you know, life changes for everyone. Life can change for everyone. So, um, you know, not being able to ambulate as well or get out as much as you could or things like that. Um, the social arena tends to change for a lot of people. There can be resentment, anger, sadness, grief, loss, loss of the, you know, what was, what's happening and social withdrawal. Um, and like I said, certainly not an all inclusive list. Now, um, on the flip side here, you know, potential rewards of caregiving. And in my work with families, um, uh, I, I, you know, it's interesting. I always feel um, somewhat inadequate or inept within myself. You know, I can, I, I, I can help people to a certain point, certainly. And that's why I'm thrilled that we're having a conversation tonight with caregivers present with us in the conversation. Um, I've been a caregiver myself, certainly not living the ALS, um, so that's different. Um, so what we know though, that there, there can be tremendous rewards, appreciating life more, um, feeling accomplished and proud um, about being able to help another, or help your loved one, um, learning new skills, um, doing things that people say to me, oh, I'll never be able to do that. And then gradually with time, they find that they're able to be just present for certain things or take on new tasks or, or whatever it may be. Growing personally, meeting these challenges, feeling needed and valuable. Um, oftentimes people express to me that they have an increased awareness of priorities and really what's important. Um, and a lot of the kind of you know, mundane or distractions that we used to focus on can fall by the wayside. Uh, learning imp and improving skills that I mentioned, strengthening relationships. There's the potential to deepen connections, make new relationships. Um, you know, there's a, there were a group of care partners that came together during COVID virtually. We, you know, they came together and um, they are still even though their loved ones have passed on, this group of five people still get together, they travel together, they have a bond that has been created that is life lasting. Um, so now to move into just the discussion around mental health and really what is mental health? There are lots of definitions on mental health. And I think of all of them, this is my own personal, uh, certainly, and I really love this working, I think it's very appropriate, this working definition. Mental health is a state of mental well-being that enables people to cope with the stresses of life, realize their abilities, learn well, and work well, contribute to their community. It is an integral component of health and well being that underpins our individual and collective abilities to make decisions, build relationships, and shape the world we live in. Wow. So I actually have this hanging up um, in my office at my house because I use this kind of as somewhat of a mission statement to be able to live this out in the work that I do with my families. And then as a caregiver, if we pay attention to our mental health, to be able to be present for ourselves and that other person and all the other people in our family potentially that, you know, or other people that need us um, is really, number one, quite a feat and also quite a rewarding possibility. So when we talk about mental health, 
I also just want to mention, because this is something else that can kind of hit people in a kind of rub way. Um, the term mental illness is used very often and unfortunately has along with it somewhat of a stigma, mental illness. And for the purposes of this, and one of the things that I do with when I'm educating the families that we work with, so the purpose of our talk tonight, thinking about physical, you know, we have physical health, and if I get sick with a cold, I have physical illness, then I have an illness, right, um, on various different severities. And this is just the same thing. So I have mental health. And then if my mental health is shifting for some reason, if I have significant stress, if I'm living with ALS, um, caring for someone that has ALS, then that can be illness, okay? So it just means a shift, a decline, we use that word. And this, uh, this, uh, these pictures here, this actually can give us a sense because as I had said in the beginning, you know, how can we tell the difference between a bad mood and maybe something more serious that may need some intervention that may be helped by, you know, talking with someone outside of us, like a professional or something to that effect. Oftentimes what I suggest to people is because certainly we can feel anxious, worried, depressed, unhappy, unhappy, even have emotional outbursts or, you know, be quiet and withdrawn. We can experience any, any of these as humans under stress momentarily for a short while. So oftentimes I encourage people just to watch. If it either you yourself or someone that you care and love, um, care about and love, you know, if it persists, if there's something that's persisting for a week, more than seven days, two weeks over time, then that would be something that would kind of alert concern. Um, so it's kind of taking all these things in consideration. Certainly if there's uh, substance abuse, if there's significant changes in behaviors, like for children or something that, you know, grades are dramatically shifting, things like that, then we definitely want to intervene. Um, but just to give a sense of the differences between, okay, so this is kind of a bad mood or I'm just in a bad place for a few hours a little bit. And then if something's more persistent, then we should probably, we want to consider intervening in some way. And we'll talk about how to do that. So now in caring for your mental health and <laughs> for anyone that is listening to this, I have been working in this arena for quite some time and we could sit for days and days and I could give you lots of tips and tricks and go out and do this and this and this. I can give you a whole list of different things to do. And one thing certainly that I have learned in the reality of ALS, time is absolutely of, of the essence. So there are so many people that can't go out and do, you know, even get to a counseling appointment or feel like they, you know, they can't get out to a yoga class or nor do they have the funds to do that or whatever it may be. So <laughs> I, over, over my career experience, I've kind of bucketed, you know, the basics, for mental health care and then advanced mental health care. So here on this slide, we have kind of the basics. And then on the next slide, we'll have kind of more advanced mental health care. So number one, number one, number one, number one, just check in, just checking into ourselves. So much when we're caring for others, our focus is outward. What do I need to do for the person? What needs to be taken care of? Things like that. So all of much of our focus is outwardly focused. So if we could just throughout the day, even once in a while, check in, am I thriving or surviving, right? Do I feel, how do I feel, right? What's happening with me? So if we feel like we're in a state of survival, it's really important that we kind of, you know, the next one, no judgment, I use no judgment, that if we can get up and just get through the day and get the basics done, that is a huge success, right? So it's kind of allowing ourselves, being realistic in terms of what is achievable throughout the day and kind of the expectations that we put on ourselves and others is, you know, being able to let them go. So 
The basics are the fundamentals. Am I drinking water? Am I drinking enough water? How am I eating? Am I eating? How's my sleep? Can I get any more sleep if I need to? Um, you know, are there ways? So these are the basics. Can I move my body? Can I see the sunlight, even if I'm looking at a wind, out a window, right? So just the basics. It's like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, if you're if you're living with ALS, that is chaos. It can be chaos some of the time, a lot of the time, right? So sometimes survival and the basic needs are all that can happen, and that is okay, right? I find so often that, and I know for myself when I was caring, um, that my needs fell off the table, right? Do I get to the doctor appointments? Am I making my own doctor appointments? And oftentimes the person living with the ALS, you know, we're making the appointments for that person. So these are the basics. Staying connected. Is there one person that I can stay connected with? And the little caveat to that is a supportive person. Um, hopefully they're supportive, right? Communicating. Communicating with my loved one, communicating with my family, communicating with myself, my needs, asking for help. We could do a whole talk on asking for help because that is, I. there are a few questions that I ask people like right off the bat. And one of them is, I usually ask the person living with ALS and also the care partner, um, how are you with asking for, how are you help and how are you with receiving help, right? So learning to ask for help um, and, and knowing that it's okay to say no to some things. It's okay to say no to some things, um, to your loved one if you need to, and also to others. Um, and also, you know, seeking out professional support if you need to, okay? So these are kind of the basics, the basic fundamentals, eating, drinking, sleep, movement, can I just stretch my body, move my arms, move the blood through the body in some way? Even if I can't get out for a 10 minute walk, can I just move the body somehow? Okay. It all helps our emotional state. Okay, so this is what I call advanced. <laughs> now, listen, these can also be some basic things. Like for my basic mental health, I have a spiritual practice. I have a meditation practice that's just like food and water to me. It needs to happen. It didn't used to be part of my life. Caregiving taught me that it needs to happen for my mental health. So counseling, um, you know, professional counseling, therapy, psychologist, psychiatry, whatever is needed. Creative arts, whatever that may be, whether it's writing, drawing, painting, these are all incredibly helpful for the mental health, for the care of our mental health. Gratitude lists. Oh my goodness. Um, yes, I mean, shifting our perception, focusing more on what is here rather than what is not uh, can be a huge, hugely helpful perception shift, uh, perspective shift. Journaling, laughter, laughter. If people, if we can just find something that makes us laugh, like, you know, silly dad jokes or a comedy or whatever even doing that with your loved one and can be tremendously helpful just to shift the mood meditation all sorts of various apps and resources for that um, music music can be very soothing to the soul any spiritual practices taking time away from als right um, if you can do that i realize that that's not possible for some people um, but if you can do that, even if it's just stepping outside or reading or looking at something different just to get away from it, um, then there's all sorts of other things, right? Yoga, Tai Chi, all these things that are really great for the, our mental well being. Okay. All right. So um, now let's just briefly, uh, we have a, just two uh, slides on caregiver resources, right? So, Supportive family, friends, clergy, coworkers, whomever, neighbors, whatever it may be, the caveat word, the operative word there is supportive, right? Do they, can they, can they, you know, just help support you in whatever way, right? Um, so try to seek those people out, those that lift you up rather than pull you down. Um, your own healthcare provider, certainly. If you feel like 
there that you are somewhat in a rut and your mental health is is uh, suffering in some way, please reach out to your own healthcare provider, whether that be your primary care physician, making a phone call, doing a telehealth visit, um, anyone else, you know, any other healthcare providers that you may have that you feel comfortable with. And certainly also the, if you are loved one, uh, the person with ALS is connected to an ALS multidisciplinary clinic team, they will help support you as well and find you resources if you need that. Um, certainly, you know, a lot of clinics have social workers, nurses, some have a mental health person. So please reach out to them as well. Um, and also, you know, communicating with that team, even in between, if, if you don't do that already, even in between visits, if you have questions about caregiving, about the physical aspects of caregiving, I know we're talking about mental pieces right now, but um, they, let them be a resource for you. And hopefully they are receptive to that as well. Um, and then other resources, the insurance companies, certainly for in-network professional psycho, um, psychological support. Yes, they can give you a list of in-network providers. And then when you're seeking out a provider, um, if you're new to this, I just want to offer that um, you have every right to interview people, interview therapists, make sure it's a good fit for you. Ask them, you know, ask them what their, uh, what their style is, you know, are, are you someone that needs somebody to give you advice? Are you someone that doesn't want somebody to give you advice, right? Therapists work all different ways. So you have every right to interview um, professionals to make sure it's a good fit. Um, okay, and then local and national or ALS organizations, there are a, thank goodness, there are uh, a good number of local and national ALS organizations. Um, MDA, of course, the Muscular Dystrophy Association is one of them that helps support ALS families and certainly in-person and virtual support groups. Um, a list of those can be found oftentimes on uh, the ALS organization uh, websites. So, and certainly you can ask me or Marissa, or um, certainly I have my uh, email at the end. So if you need any, you know, uh, resources, please feel free to reach out. And then some other resources, and these are just some websites that can be quite helpful that I offer to uh, many of our families. Um, Share the Care and Caring Bridge. These two are fairly similar. They're uh, alike in some ways. So in terms of asking for help and the model that it takes a village, um, which is incredibly true. And I have to absolutely say that um, those that are able to have a various number of people helping when the needs increase um, tend to do well, right? That can be a really great model. So these Share the Care and Caring Bridge websites are um, sites where you can put updates about your about your loved one if that's a desire. You can actually create calendar of needs, whether it be food shopping, um, transportation, rides, and then other people can kind of plug in where they can help. So it's a shared kind of community support. And, you know, you can invite just the people that you are wanting to help you um, in the care. And it can be a really great resource to kind of share. And then the other nice thing that it does is it allows the person, whether it be the person living with ALS or you, the caregiver, not to have to keep asking. So oftentimes there's a coordinator of these, you know, sites and then like a family friend or family member or something that takes that on. And then you don't have to keep asking for a ride to this, a ride to that. Oh, I need, you know, the medications picked up that people can just see the need and then plug things in. Um, so it can be a really nice resource. Your ALS guide, I have to say, um, has tons of videos. It also has a care, it talks about mental health, talks about caregiving, um, and it has a ton of videos in terms of helping um, how to do stretching, how to do all sorts of various, uh, it's a wonderful educational tool. Family Caregiver Alliance, Caregiver Action Network, and Well Spouse Association. These are all organizations that support caregivers and caregiving, not specific to ALS. Um, they are all various uh, chronic conditions. 
Okay, just have, they do have really great resources. They have some meditations on there, things like that. So it can be helpful. Um, all right, and I do just want to offer, um, and, and I say thank you. And um, before I actually do say thank you, um, I just want to offer that one of the things that I try to encourage our families, um, and and anyone else really is, you know, as a mental health nurse, um, is prevention, 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 prevention. We know that the journey with ALS. Um, you know, the, the intensity tends to increase over time. So the earlier that we can begin instituting um, efforts to support, you know, resources for support, um, habits of self-care, things like that, the earlier in the progression, the earlier in the disease that we can do that um, really can be beneficial because then when, you know, time is crunched and, you know, life is a bit more intense, then those things are already in the in place often and and they they can you know you can access them a bit more easily. So I always encourage and advocate for preventive uh, mental health care. Um, and I certainly, of course, hope this this was helpful. I you know I know we're going to continue the conversation. And the biggest thing I want to say here is that's why you is in capital letters because you are so important right thank you there are really no words to to express the deep sincere gratitude um because trust i i see all i have seen all sorts of dynamics play out all sorts of and i think i've seen everything but i haven't i'm sure um all sorts of scenarios within the you know family system of someone in a family living with als so i when i say thank you for all that you do, it is not lost on me the challenges that you face day in and day out in the front and in the background, um, in your head and in your heart. So we do sincerely thank you and uh, yeah, let's continue the conversation. So I will stop sharing. There we go. And Thank you so much, uh, Mary, for for sharing those resources, those those thoughts and perspectives. I think all of what you said is very powerful and and helpful. So thank you. Um, let's kind of uh, turn to our our panel here. I wanted to introduce two more members of our panel. Um, we'd like to welcome Sabrina Johnson and Maria Alejandra um, to the call, along with Mary. And this next half hour, we'd really like to just spend some time um, hearing from you and, and going through some different questions about what it's like being a caregiver. Um, but before we launch into questions, I'd love for you to both introduce yourselves and um, your background and, and why you're here tonight. So we'll start with uh, you, Sabrina. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> That might help. Hi there. Thank you so much for having me and Mary. I wrote down, I have like two pages worth of notes. So thank, thank you. It was very informative. My name is Sabrina Johnson. My dad was diagnosed with ALS in 2017 and unfortunately passed away less than two years later. Um, about a year after his passing, I decided to what I like to call turn my anger into ambition and started to advocate for our patients and families in really transformed um, my life, my family's life, and started to become a patient and family advocate and end-of-life doula. And a big mission of mine is to um, not only help in the advocating aspect for patients and families, but to help patients and families find their own voice and to learn how to advocate for um, themselves and for their um, families as well throughout their ALS journey. So I have two sons. My oldest son was two when my dad was diagnosed. My youngest son was two weeks old when my dad passed away. So I went through a lot as a daughter, wife, and mom throughout our ALS journey. And I love getting to help um, caregivers going through this journey and you know work on 
how to, I like to call it, like work on finding the beauty in the beast of the disease. Thank you, Sabrina. Maria. Hi, everyone. So beautifully said, Sabrina, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Maria Alejandra Fernandez. I also go by MA. And my husband, Julian, was diagnosed with ALS three years ago in May of 2020 when he was just 35 years old. So we're a very young couple navigating through something hard like everybody else here can understand. We have a six-year-old son named Skyler. He was three when Jules was diagnosed. We live in Miami. And I've gone through so many layers of what it means to be a caregiver. I love care partner. Actually, thank you for that, Mary. It's a beautiful reframe. And I've walked through so many dimensions of what it means to be um, a wife and a mom and a woman and all of the dimensions of how our life has changed and how I, along with my husband, continue to really look for the 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 gifts and all of the challenges that ALS brings, which are many. And it's just beautiful to have these conversations to expand the circle of people that I know. It's like the extended family you never knew you had or needed or you know, uh, expected, but we're here for each other and it's it's lovely to be here. So thank you very much. Well, thank you both. Um, let's go ahead and, and launch into some questions here. Um, how do you manage or, or did you manage, Sabrina, the relationship of being both a caregiver or care partner and a daughter or a spouse um, you know, what impact did that have on the relationship? How did you navigate those nuances and, and dynamics? So for our family, so just to bring it out, um, I have one younger brother. So my, out of my parents, my parents, my brother and I, and so something for our family dynamic on that aspect of it, being a daughter, our big thing was, we call, I call my dad Tone. So a lot of people in the ALS community will often hear me and refer to him as Tone. So we kind of called it Tone's way or the highway right away. Whether we agreed with it or not, we were going to kind of walk through the journey with that mindset of Tone's way or the, or the highway. And so that I think helped right away to kind of walk into the journey knowing that we were going to put his belief first we you know we weren't the ones feeling this disease um i i think that really helped as we were going through the journey then to be able to put kind of our own ideas you know our own uh, emotions sometimes away because we could just kind of go in you know that doesn't mean we weren't able to have conversations be able to state our opinions on things but we were really able from the beginning to separate some of the stubbornness that like a typical South Side Chicago family normally has and just be able to sit down and hear him out and remember that he was the one that was, you know, ultimately going through this disease. So that helped when it came to being the daughter aspect of really remembering that while we were all transitioning as a family, he was ultimately the one that was going through it being diagnosed. When it came to being a daughter in the aspect of, you know, with my mom, my brother, um, on that side of it, it was hard to um feel like you couldn't crumble in a way same thing with then being a, a mom and wife i kind of struggled a lot i loved when mary brought up the mental health aspect um i really struggled at first about feeling like i if i broke everybody below me would break so it was very hard at first to feel like i couldn't um, stress how I was feeling. I really walked on eggshells or just around myself. And it took me a while to feel okay with letting others um, help. And I think once we all kind of 
took a step back and we're like, okay, we need to do this all together of just knowing that the rest of us as a team need to come together and and let each other help in in the aspect of caring um, is when we all kind of could take a deep breath of allowing ourselves to say like, okay, what do we as caregivers really need as well? Which like Mary was saying, like sleep, <laughs> water, eating, because you do forget those things and you don't, you when you're going through things, you you don't think that you're going to. You're like, how how does somebody forget to eat or drink or sleep? Um, but then when you're going through it and you're you're just kind of in the middle of the ocean, you realize how easily it it, it becomes to put that life vest on yourself. And so um, once we kind of all looked around and kind of like the Kelly Clarkson quote of like, you need to put the um, what is it like the air on yourself <laughs> and then be able to put it on everybody else is when we all kind of were able to, I think, care for everybody a little bit easier. Um, I'll for Jules and I, so the, dyna the dynamic of being husband and wife is a, is a one that is a unique path that we walk on. I think one of the things early on is we made it a choice to really communicate as much as possible in every moment and through everything to define and decide between the two of us how we wanted to navigate through this. And of course, this is a it's a disease and um, a journey and a path that brings so many um, twists and turns and curveballs. So it's not like, you know, you kind of you kind of take things as they come and have to really prioritize living moment by moment. And I think from the beginning, we, we, and it's a choice. Like I, I, we talk a lot about choosing to always come back to one another, choosing to see ourselves first and foremost as a husband and wife. And for me, very personally, choosing to see him as my husband, the love of my life, my partner in crime, my best friend, this guy that I fell madly in love with and love more and more each day. And I have so many moments that challenge that because of how exhausting things can be days and nights that just seem like I I'm stretched beyond what a human being should be stretched. And I, but the idea of always coming back to he's my guy and we are a team doing this together and i'm not doing this for him i'm doing this with him and it's beautiful because mary in one of the slides you had the word honor an honorable like it's an honor and i've used that word i love seeing it there because i used that word from the beginning um because it really has felt like an honor to be a part of my you know spiritual belief is that i was i was put on this earth in this lifetime to support my husband through this. And so it was my son and we decided to do it together in some beautiful cosmic way. And so I hold that close to me and it really does feel like an honor to be with him. And in my hardest moments, I ask myself, like even when I'm like, oh my God, I just wanna like run for the hills and not deal with this ever again. I think, well, would I want anybody else to be here with him through this? And the answer is always no, I, I, it's me. And so my husband also, we, we record a podcast together that we've been doing for the past few years. We started before his diagnosis and then shifted into really telling our ALS story. Um, we've chosen to share, you know, things that are both challenging and intimate and funny and, loving and everything in between because it just feels like the real raw thing to do and that has really helped us um and always preserving again that that sort of sanctity and the fun of we're still a married couple and we can fight like a married couple and um always see that as first and foremost beyond everything else that's happening i love that i had the like the same idea as well my, so my dad was a wonderful I mean, absolutely wonderful dad. And so I always had that mind, the same kind of mindset as well of like, why wouldn't I? You know, when 
when we were sick as kids or, you know, ever needed anything, like my dad was, the, my dad worked nights. And so he was the type when we'd get home from school, there was always a snack on the table and we'd talk about our day. And um, so it was like the moment that he was sick, there was no question in my mind of wanting to be involved, wanting to be there and help him. And so it, it it's one of those things, I think sometimes it's like instinctually in you of, you know, like that, like honoring them. When you love somebody, sometimes it's just like, you know, you just want to move mountains to help the people that you love. And it does, it is an honor to get to be there for the people in your life in a way that is so, I think, like personable too and vulnerable and you get to help somebody. Um, and yeah, I love, how you explained it too, like it is an honor to get to be there for somebody that you love. But I think it's also when you do love someone, you don't question it too. You just are there. And I think when you think of it on the other aspect, they'd be there for you just like with no thought too, because they honor, respect, and love you. And I think it's just amazing to have that type of relationship whether it's, you know, father, daughter, husband, wife, brother, sister, you know, parents, things like that, just to have any type of support, supportive person in your life that you just do what you need to do because it, it's an honor to have people that you support in your life. Yeah. No, thank you both for sharing that. And, um, you know, I think you already touched on another one of our questions, which was what rewards have you found as a caregiver? Um, I'd like to switch gears a little bit um, and talk about what advice you might give to a caregiver who needs help, but is afraid to ask for that help. So one of my things, um, and I'm like kind of laughing because I, I, even to this day, I cannot stand like the phrase self care because I, I just think that it's, it's hard to understand. Um, it, cause it's so different for everybody, but I think like growing up, I kind of always thought of like self care is like this word and phrase that kind of was associated with like going to the spa, um, getting your hair done, your nails done, things like that. And then when you're in a caregiving role, people are always kind of telling you like, make sure that you're caring for yourself, make sure that you have time, you know, for self care, things like that. And I would get very frustrated because I'm like, I can't breathe. I can't find time to eat, to drink, to bathe, you know, like what, what is the self care? And so I, you know, I like to try and help people understand self care in different ways or to break that mindset that they might have. And, so when you're trying to think of ways to ask for help but are afraid to ask to think of things that bring you joy instead of it as a way to ask for help so for me for example something that brings me joy is a mcdonald's diet coke so a way to care for myself sometimes is to just be able to give or to get or like take a moment to go get a Diet Coke. And so um, when people are coming over then asking for a Diet Coke, for example, sometimes for me, just receiving that is a way for me to get help. Um, there's, there's different ways sometimes to first kind of open that door into asking for help. Um, I think for myself at least, when you find the first step of what brings you joy to ask for, like a Diet Coke or um, a bath bomb, if you enjoy, you know, a bath or, um, you know, the, the joyous part of your life, once you kind of break open that part of asking for something, it helps to start to creak open that door a little bit, um, a little bit more each time. So that was something that is was my kind of go-to was starting with something that was joyous to me to ask for which then helped me to start asking for a little bit more in to ways of asking for help 
And I would say to all of us in caregiving roles is to be gentle with ourselves, um, to breathe through the moments as much as possible, to stay present. And I know all of these things are very, very hard, but even if it's um, a moment of uh, just being with what is and acknowledging the present space that you're in and the beauty that comes from sharing your love in such a deep, profound way. Um, I said in, in DC recently that, you know, the, nothing cracks us open more than the profound love that comes from something as raw and um, challenging as caring for somebody. And also all the beautiful gifts of getting to know that person and know yourself in whole new dimensions. And then when it comes to asking other people for help, that's a total mixed bag. There's so many layers to it because there's the guilt that comes from asking for help. There's the work that we can do internally with ourselves with, you know, sometimes maybe a therapist to help us how learn how to receive and how to allow ourselves to let go of certain things and, and bring in support. Um, one of the reframes that has helped me in a sort of practical kind of mindset way when it comes to asking for help is realizing and reminding myself time and time again that anybody who comes in to support my husband and who we ask for help, it benefits their life as well. Mm -hmm. It is something that ripples, you know, challenging as it is, ripples love and it's, it cracks them open too, that it creates connection points, that it helps us see the, you know, who we really are. And a lot of that has also been accepting the reality that a lot of people that we thought early on would be like right there to help us in front of the line weren't. And that's something that we went through that was really challenging or didn't show up for us the way that we thought they would or could or should, you know, all these expectations. Um, and at the same time, we also saw beautiful people emerge from places that we really weren't even expecting, um, whether it was old friends or more distant family or, you know, people that kind of crept back into our lives that offered ways to help us that blew our mind and, and shifted the way we thought about them before. That was a beautiful surprise. Um, but when it comes to asking for help and I get, I feel the waves of guilt every time because I'm my husband's main 24 seven caregiver and him and I have a certain rhythm and a certain way of doing things that it's like a, it's like a dance, right? So we know, we know how to be with each other and I know how to care for him and how to do all the physical things. And of course the emotional and somebody else comes in, it's a whole new ball game where we have to, you know, coach somebody through what it means to care for duels. And being willing to do that so that I can have some moments of release and uh, breath um, are profound. And it's helped me grow immensely as a person to allow myself to receive support and to not know that I have to hold everything on so tight and to think that we have to have control over certain things and realize that having a certain focus about how, you know, we, we, we like to see things sort of done and how we think, you know, things should happen and the care that we want to give to our partner or family member or friend, um, but also being flexible enough to let other things come into the picture and really keep dancing with that is, you know, the, that flexibility I think is really key as well. I think also um, too, like, you know, just like we, with asking for help, people want to offer help in such different ways. And so I think it's one of those like not, you know, kind of being willing to offer or to, so I'll guess I'll backtrack for a second. We first, um, when my dad was diagnosed, put out a GoFundMe in it. First, my mom was like, I don't know, you know, I'm nervous. What if people like don't want to, or, you know, and I was like, but sometimes people want to help and they don't know how to help. So putting things out there, like even like the um, websites that Mary offered, like um, Share the Care or um, 
GoFundMe's or um, the meal trains, things like that. Putting out websites like that for people to be able to help you or your family, I think allows people a chance to help in different ways. Because I think there's so many people that want to help and don't know how. And like you said, Emma, like people, when people either run for the woods or they run out of the woods to help you in a time of need. Which well said. Is, <laughs> right. And it surprises exactly. you. It surprises you in both ways. Like there, I mean, people came out of the woodworks and it was like, wow, this is amazing. And then the people that ran into the woods are like, whoa, surprising. But I think as the as the people that are are the caregivers, sometimes you, it's nice to give the people in your life options, saying like, mm. okay, here's, yeah, here's our favorite pizza place. Here's what we typically get from there. Here's what we get from McDonald's. Here's what we get from the Chinese place. Here's, you know, like we use Amazon all the time because with ALS, things are changing yesterday. So we need, we need Prime. We need delivery now. Um, so I think it also giving people a chance to help in a variety of ways lets them also decide like what is also best for them because we're we're all learning you know they've also never had um, friends and family that are dealing with this disease just like we've never dealt with it too so we also kind of have to learn on both sides of it as well and and also be comfortable releasing people and accepting like uh, that people are going to leave and exit our life and saying that is okay thank you for the time we've had with you and you know the people that there are people that will come out of the woodworks as well and you will be very happy to have the support that that you have thank you both for sharing that i um we are getting a little short on time i wanted to um pose this question to mary too um having worked with so many different families different dynamics i'm sure you've come across caregivers who feel guilty asking for help, who don't know how to ask for help, who, you know, are just um, don't even know where to start or what to ask for. Um, so what kind of practical advice do you give those caregivers um, that are maybe afraid or feel guilty or just don't even know where to start? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, it's a great question and I really appreciate all of what they've said um, and would yeah, pretty much echo all that. So. Um, uh, with a lot of people, I will actually like, we'll play the imagination game, um, where I invite them to imagine, um, you know, how life would be and how they will feel potentially if they don't ask for help and what they can envision it will look like if they don't ask for help. Um, and then we do the flip and I invite them to consider and imagine what it would look like if they did ask for help, how they might feel, um, what kinds of things, you know, and I do it typically in that order. Um, and that seems to help people shift. You know, some people said to me, oh, my God, I, I, I can't not I can't do this alone. I, I just, I can't do it alone. I have to, you know, so, um, and then just, you know, in terms of where to even start, um, we, you know, and that's where hopefully they, you know, the team could be a resource to help with that, whether it's the nurse or the social worker or something. Um, we help to kind of break that down. You know, what does the day look like, right? What are things that you absolutely have to do? And we'll make kind of a two, we'll take like a placemat, and what are the things that you absolutely have to do? And what are the things that maybe somebody else could do? Right? So we, we do kind of help them, you know, break it down just to real practical. Okay, I get up in the morning, take me through the day. What's the next task and the next task and the next task? And anything that we can dele delegate goes to that list for possibly share the care. Or, and then we talk through, you know, what might you say? Who maybe could be a helper? Um, yeah, so really taking it step by step because it, it can be quite a foreign, um, yeah, scary thing for people. Thank you, Mary. 
Um, because we are running out of time, I want to end on a question um, for everybody. Who or what has been your greatest source of support as a caregiver? So this could be somebody that you leaned on as a as a caregiver or even just like a resource that you found. Um, but I'd like to kind of close with that. So Maria, you want to share? You know, the first thing that came to mind was my um, defining my own a humble spiritual practice, right? Like really um, looking to my own inner inner world um, and cultivating that. And I think there are some really wonderful, uh, I think, support groups as well. There's one in particular that I joined that has many people in it, and it's it it was at a certain point in time that I was ready for it. Cause there's also like so many levels and dimensions of once we get into the journey that you feel like if you want to hear about stuff, you don't hear about stuff. And so allowing myself to kind of see it bit by bit, but um, absolutely speaking with and hearing from other people that are going through the same thing. They are the ones that will know more than anybody else. All the well-meaning people in the world can never know exactly like, you know, what someone else can you know, will tell you from their lived experience. So seeking that out, and I've met some incredible people in the process. So that's been really fun too. Love that. Sabrina? Yeah, I kind of echo that. I think there's so many great, so the ALS community is one that you don't necessarily like, you know, wake up and hope to be in, but if you're going to be in a community, they are the, most welcoming, most loving community that you can ever be a part of. And so I would just say to not be afraid to reach out to people on social media, um, you know, just even like hashtag ALS, hashtag ALS awareness. I mean, you will find an abundance of amazing community members that all want to meet other amazing community members. And so, I mean, MA and I met in DC and just to not be afraid to go to events or to send somebody a message, to comment on something. Um, this is a community that wants to meet people and help people because the, the people that are going through it are the ones that know things to the deepest part of the core. So to, feel comfortable asking a community member for help, for advice, for comfort and support. Um, we all want to help and be there. And so to just know that, you know, anybody on social media is wanting you to to reach out. So please feel free to come to any, any event that you see or any social media member that you see um, in the, community, please reach out to them as well if you're looking for guidance. Wonderful. Thank you. Mary, is there anything that has stood out to you and all the work that you've done with families as like a, a source of support, whether it's a person, a resource? Um, it's actually the exact same thing that they said, the exact same thing, that no one one of the things that I try to do is, you know, people that don't want to be in support groups, you know, that feel like that's maybe a little too intimidating, especially from, you know, what MA had said, like, I don't know if I want to see that. Um, one of the things I try to do is then just set people up individually, you know, because I say, like, it's just, it is the greatest resource that you will ever have. Like, they know in a way that we never will, or may never will, but yeah, for right now, we don't. Yeah, I'm glad you shared that. Um, and that actually reminds me that MDA has um, MDA connections. If you connect with our resource center, give our resource center a call or an email and say that you're interested in connecting with another caregiver, um, or even if your family member with ALS wants to connect with another person with ALS, we also can help um, navigate those connections for one-on-one -on -one, um, support as well. So um, we'll put our resource center um, phone number and email in the chat. Um, but I we are so out, like out of time, um, but I did want to open it up in the chat if there was anybody that had any questions um, that we could try to cover in the next minute. <laughs> um, so I'll give folks a second to type in anything that they want to ask.
Looks like I got one here. Um, this question I actually could apply to all of you about how do you manage motherhood in addition to being a caregiver? Um, so Sabrina as, mm. as a daughter and then a mother of young kids and, and Maria with having a six-year-old, how do you how do you juggle that? I feel like it goes to Mary's comment of um, surviving, not thriving for a little bit of time. But you just sometimes have to, you know, find the jokes in the day, become the joke of the day, <laughs> laugh a little bit. Um, I have this big mindset of moments become memories. And so sometimes you have to wake up and tell yourself, like, what is the memory that you want today to be? And find something to laugh about and to enjoy the day. There's a beautiful part of every day. And so sometimes you have to reach hard to find it. But sometimes you just have to remember that there's a precious little one that's looking up to you. And their memories are worth making funny moments over. Mm -hmm. So that's sometimes what you just have to kind of get through the day to remember. Um, and I'll share for me, I, I really believe in bringing the little ones into the conversation and into the experiences as much as possible. Um, in whatever capacity they have and age and understanding they have, allowing them to ask as many questions, explaining things, not hiding things, um, allowing it to be a part of life. This is their life. And this is something that they, you know, um, are growing up with differently than many other kids. And that's a reality, right? And so, and for me, juggling the attention, right? It's like, I, you know, I my husband's become another kid and, um, Plus we have a dog, so, you know, it's like, there's, there's a lot of things happening in the house. So the attention early on that I wanted to, you know, it's like getting split in different directions of making sure that Skylar, our son feels attended to enough. And while he sees his dad and, um, I've gotten support, like, you know, a therapist, parenting therapist, just to be proactive about how to address certain things that has been supportive as well. Um, moving through, you know, moment by moment and not wanting to sort of like, yeah, like hide things away, but just have it be all part of our day to day as much as, as much as possible. Yeah. I love that, that you shared that you get him involved. Um, mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I think that's really important and um really valuable for him to have those those memories with with your husband mm -hmm. um, well thank you um all so much for being here tonight um we just can't thank you enough for sharing your story for for being candid and open um with with everybody here um thank you I'd also like to thank our webinar supporters, Cytokinetics and Mitsubishi Tanabe Pharma America. We appreciate their ongoing support of our, our community education program. Um, just a quick plug this weekend um, for those that might be listening that are on the East Coast, we will actually be meeting in person um, to um, hear from experts in the field around uh, different topics related to neuromuscular disease. So being held this Saturday in less than 48 hours. So if you're in the area and want to attend, it's free. Um, and we'd love to have you join us. Um, we also wanna encourage anybody who's on the, the line to join uh, the MDA community. It's free, um, it's available to anybody diagnosed with a neuromuscular disease, their loved ones, um, and you can um, get different um, benefits and just be part of a community where information is shared or Quest Magazine is delivered to your home. You get individual outreach and support from our care specialists. So if you're not already a member, we encourage you to join our community. And we want to uh, thank you for attending. We would love to hear your comments about this webinar. So if you have a smartphone, you can open your camera, point it at the QR code and a web page will pop up with a short survey on today's webinar. If you don't have a smartphone, uh, the link will also be put in the chat and you'll receive the link in an email after this. Um, so if anybody has any questions after this webinar, 
uh, please feel free to email or call our resource center. Again, if you want to be connected um, to another caregiver or another person living with ALS, we can help make those connections as well. You just need to call our resource center. And uh, again, I want to thank Sabrina, Mary, and Maria for being here tonight and for sharing your stories and, and your expertise and, and perspectives with us. And uh, this concludes our ALS virtual learning series. Thank you very much for attending and uh, we hope to see everybody again soon.